is part two of Tiny Shiny Photogrammetry. My name is Diana Pearl McNutt and I'm here at the University of Reading Archaeology Department. In this video today of Tiny Shiny Photogrammetry, we're going to go over data processing. This is how you process your photos before you start your Agisoft PhotoScan standard modeling process. Before I go into anything else, I've sort of hinted at before, is that if you've done photogrammetry before, you might notice that I go a bit overkill on making the texture and the form as perfect as possible. By creating so many photos, as well as really fiddling within the modeling process of creating a good amount of these two things. The reason I do this is I think it's valuable to look at your project as what it's going to actually be used for. By looking at its final goal of what it's actually going to be used for, you can determine your data processing as well as your model building and the things you need to work on. For my project, it's called Access Through Photogrammetry, which is to digitize and 3D model the teaching collection here at the University of Reading Archaeology Department. My models are going to be used to teach university students about typology. Because of this, my models need to be relatively the 3D model equivalent of artifact illustrations. They need to be precise in order for students to learn about how to identify them and how they're made. That is why I don't fudge anything. But feel free to fudge what you want, skip through some stuff. But it is very important to follow step two and three in this video. If you want to skip part one, Go ahead, fun by me. Now let's go get started. Before I get started doing anything else, I think I need to explain what data processing is. When I refer to data or data sets, I mean the images that you have taken in your camera and then load on to your computer, which are then processed through different steps in order to gain a final image that you can use in Agisoft PhotoScan to build your three-dimensional model. There are three main steps, creating a file system for your project, widening out the images and converting to a stable file format, and then masking the photos in Adobe Photoshop. For the first, creating a file system for your project, can be used for other projects, not just tiny, shiny objects. I love uniform file systems, and that is why I'll give a quick little shout out to it. Having a uniform file system allows for not only an ease of use, but an ease of access. What I mean by this is an ease of use is that I pre-make all my folders before I even upload any photos onto my computer. By having a set system, I can go through all my different steps and keep track of where I am and have places ready, go, ready to go to save all my work. For an ease of access, it allows for me to go back if I in the future and actually look at my work and understand the different steps that I did and what images to use and not go, oh my, I have no idea what I did, I don't know what images to use, there's 40 different folders. So I'll quickly show you my little system, and then I will head on to the other steps. So this is my file system, feel free to use it or adapt it to your own, whatever seems logical to yourself. So I have my main projects folder where I'll have all my different projects, so you know, all my different brooches. I would suggest giving an extremely detailed name for your project because you shouldn't be afraid of having an extremely long title. Often this is actually very good because you will be able to look very quickly into the file and understand which one you want. So this one I labeled enameled bow brooch Silchester and that's where it was found. If I can, I also put the small finds number because that allows it to be searched and is used in the eventual description when it's uploaded to Sketchfab. So I'll go into my master folder here and I'm 
stick to just four files. That way the information isn't scattered everywhere. So I have the CR2, so I give it a name of describing what the file format is and what the images are. So CR2 is a camera raw file and their originals. I have my digital negative, which is my stable file format, which I'll talk in a second about, and these ones have been edited. They're then the masked images. These are the ones that have then been put through Photoshop and masked out. These are the images that you will load onto your actual photogrammetry project. And finally, I keep all the model files together so the project files as well as the project itself within this one folder. That way it isn't scattered around in random places. All right, now that we have set up our file system, it's ready to go to begin our other processing steps. Now that I have created my file system for the project and I have taken the CR2 originals from my camera and I've put them into the CR2 original file folder, I can begin the process of editing the images and then masking the images. So it's done for step two, which is white out the images and convert to stable file format. I know I'm going to get a bit of flack for editing my images. A lot of times it's recommended to not edit your images before putting them into Agisoft PhotoScan. For me though, I need to create a perfectly white background or at least a very different background from the image in order to mask them. I have found that whiting out, so increasing the exposure by incremental amounts and then increasing the white bar, this allows for easy masking as well as not compromising the object itself. Also with Agisoft PhotoScan, everything needs to be synchronized. And the way in order to do this, to both edit the image and synchronize the images, image changes, is to use Camera Raw. Now for this whole project, I use Bridge and Photoshop. So I'm gonna open up Bridge. I'm gonna look at my CR2 original folder. I'm gonna select all of them and open them in Camera Raw. Good thing about Camera Raw is that you have all your images in one place and you can edit them simultaneously. So here we go. I am going to change the exposure, as I said, in very incremental bits. Don't wanna go crazy. You don't wanna go all the way to the end and lose everything. Very small amounts. I am gonna maybe go to 60. As you can see, the all the files are slowly changing. Here, see it? There it goes. And I'm just gonna click around at some of these images and make sure that the object has not been affected. And as you can see, there is no significant changes to the object itself. Now with the newspaper and the putty, we also want it to be as white as possible so it's easy to mask it out. In order to do this, I'm gonna up the whites, which is this white bar here. And I'm gonna move it tiny incremental amounts. I would say more, no more than 30 maximum. Here we go. I think I will go to 20. And as you can see, all the, this is now all perfectly white. And I'm just gonna make sure that they're all at 20. There we go. And so now all the images are at 20 plus for whites and an extra plus 0.60 for the exposure. So now I can save these images and at the same time, create a stable file format. Now I'm gonna get a bit techy on you for a second. A CR2, which is the camera raw file for Canon, 
is an unstable file format. The same is true for the file formats for Nikon, Leica, and the other digital camera companies. They often change their file format, so even though it says CR2, they compete completely different file formats. Also, many different software and programs cannot open up CR2 files, or if they can, they can only open newer version or even older versions. So it's important to put them into a stable file format that does not lose compression, like JPEG. So you want to keep it in the same raw file format. So I'm going to separate my images into a top and a bottom by scrolling through, looking for where one, looking for where it flips, and this is where it flips. So I'm going to select all those images that are of the top. And I'm going to go to Save Images. I'm going to select a folder. I'm going to DNG Edited. And I'm going to create a folder that's called Side A. Because this will be the Side A model that you will eventually make out of these, fi out of these files. So you're going to select that. And you're going to create a name like Side A. And you're going to create a digital negative. Digital negative is a stable file format that can be easily turned into other file formats and is relatively sustainable. TIFF is another one, but I prefer digital negative for no other reason than really the name and how I've been taught. So I'm going to go to save. And you can see the little status bar here in the corner, which informs you how many of them are remaining. So I'm going to pause this for a bit and run and grab a cup of tea. Now that that side has loaded, I'm going to select the other side here. I'm going to save these images and I'm going to create a file folder called side B. And I'll name them side B and as a digital negative as well. And now we'll go let it run again, and I'll be back in a bit. Now we're back, and we have widened out our images. We've converted them to a stable format, and we've put them away into our lovely file system. And now it's time to mask the photos in Adobe Photoshop. It's at this point I think I need to stop and explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. If you've done photogrammetry before, it may seem a bit crazy and overkill to have this many photos, so 115 for the entire model, as well as masking every single photo and taking the object out of the background. With my experimentations of very small objects, I have found that Agisaw Photoscan is not like small objects and does not treat them in the same way that you would do with a normal model. With a normal model, um, if you have a small terracotta pot, even the size of your fist, you take the photos, you put them into Agisaw Photo Scan, you either mask out the background, sometimes the base, a lot of times just very loosely if you do, you start with the alignment, you go through all the steps, Bob's your uncle, you got a model. The problem is with small objects is that Agisaw Photoscan is point based. It looks for points in the actual photo. The more points there are, that's what it thinks, what you're trying to model. So I made a little model of the enamel brooch using just the 32 photos unmasked, and this is what you get. So these are the cameras here. There's a lovely dome. We've got a nice portion of 
the object as well as a lovely model of the newspaper. Looks pretty good, it's on medium. Now we go to the dense cloud and that's where things go wrong. I'll turn off the camera so you can see this better. The object has bits of newspaper flying around. There's bits of the object that's gone over this way. We've got some chunks missing in the tip and some pretty nasty ragged edges. Now, the reason this happens is because there is a lot of points in the base, none in the object. And this is true with a lot of them. So, here in this one, you can see it even more. It doesn't even recognize this section as part of the object. Photoscan looks at this and says, this is where the majority of the points are. This is what you must want to be modeled. If you do photos that have a very low image quality and they're slightly out of focus, this is maybe even worse. So instead of creating a not so good actual model of the object, it doesn't recognize any points within the object and creates a lovely model of the newspaper with a hole in the middle where your object's supposed to go. This is why I mask. I'm telling Agisaw Photoscan that they should only look for points within this object. And they will find a large majority of points, especially with a high image quality that I have done. I also mask it in Photoshop because I get a higher level of precision. With these objects especially, they have very jagged, corroded edges that cannot be, uh, cannot be batch processed in any way. They need to be hand masked. It's a long, tedious process, especially the 115 photos, but it is extremely worth it at the end, I guarantee it. So now I'll move on, to Agishop, uh, move on to Photoshop and get started on showing you how to mask out your object. Now it's time for the long journey of masking out all your images. But trust me, it's going to be completely worth it. Go to your project folder, go into your DNG edited, side A. Open your first side A, open it in Photoshop, here you go. Now looking at it in Photoshop, I think you can understand a bit better about why it's so difficult to mask these any other way than hand mask. This is a Roman brooch. It has a lot of corrosion on it. You can see that there's indentations here, there's jagged edges all the way around, and any sort of auto select will not work. And it's just easier in the long run to hand mask and you will not lose as much information. Also you will get a really close mask which will prevent any sort of haloing on the final model. The way I'm going to do this is by first selecting, so I'm going to use the select tool over here, the quick selection tool. I'm going to do the normal one here, not the additive or subtractive, but just the normal one here. I'm going to press the alt button because that will help it snap. Go down, do a quick check to make sure it's got everything. And this is the one place where you can automate, because all the masking steps after you select is all the same. The way to automate it is to do an action. So go to the action window. If it hasn't popped up, go to the bar on top, and it should be here under 3D. You're going to go to the post-it note here to create a new action. Click on the post-it note. 
give it a simple name like enamel that enamel record and now you go through the steps you go down to the square with a hole in it and that's a mask click on that file save as and you go to your masked images create a new folder called side a open save okay stop which is the little square button here now if you go on to another image let's just say this one here one with the newspaper let's try one with the newspaper open with photoshop now this is where having a newspaper with nothing annoying on it really comes in handy i have hedy lamar on this one she's my hero and um, on another brooch I had a review for padding to bear so a happy padding to bear anything that relieves stress or is not stressful because you're going to be staring at it for a good long while it's completely worth it so let's go into here and you're going to mask out your object and remember to mask out the putty it's very important you can see that with a very high focus you can get a much cleaner and easier mask you're going to go to the beginning of your action press play and it'll automate it for you so you do this the for your entire side a before moving on to side b with side b open side one the first image now you flip flop instead of starting a new action there is a way to make it a little simpler just delete the save okay zoom in a bit do your selection press play click on make record file save as Mass images, new folder, side B, open, save, OK, stop. All right, that finishes up side B51. And we are all finished with our masking and our data processing. For our next video, we will be going over a flip-flop method workflow to create a perfect aligned three-dimensional model in Agisoft PhotoScan standard. See you next time.